Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Vesperisms, the art of thinking for yourself. I'm your host, author, illustrator, Vesper Stamper, and this is your sometimes weekly, sometimes 15-minute recalibration of your artistic worldview. So grab your coffee and have a seat in my studio, and let's have a chat. This is episode 10, Narrating a Cloud of Outrageous Blue, my special interview with narrator L. Potter. Friends, I am taking a big, deep breath from the last couple of episodes, which were so heavy and current events-based. And I think every one of us has been living in at least a mild state of shock for some months now. And I don't know about you, but I need a reset. Summer is always a hard time for me anyway. I'm one of those rare birds with a summer onset of seasonal affective disorder. So things that happen in summer are kind of extra overwhelming. So I wanted, in fact, I needed to switch gears to talk about something hopeful and exciting, which is the imminent release of my new novel, A Cloud of Outrageous Blue. Cloud comes out on August 25th, wherever you love to buy books. It's coming out through audiobook and through ebook and through hardcover. And I encourage you to order it through your local independent bookstore and support your community through this tough year. They would really love to have your order. And so would I. Those of you who follow my work know that my main gig is writing and illustrating YA historical fiction novels. And with my last book, What the Night Sings, I heard from a lot of readers and parents that the audiobook was particularly impactful for reluctant readers or those with learning challenges, especially when it was read alongside the physical copy. It's sort of a multimedia experience when you have the physical copy that's also illustrated and the audiobook. And because of the sheer volume of sources in my own research process, I can't possibly read all the physical books that I need to, so I do listen to a lot of audiobooks. And I know the importance of a great narrator can really make or break the experience of the book. Now, I'm very fortunate to have part in the audition process of my audiobooks. And when I heard the audition tapes for A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, I knew right away that it was this woman, Elle Potter, who I would choose to narrate. She is a lovely reader, and she's a lovely person with an interesting background in both literature and theater. In this interview, we talk about some classic Vesperism's values. We're just one artist talking to another about the creation of a work we participated in, in a sense, together. But before the interview, here's an excerpt from the audiobook of A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, narrated by L. Potter. I wake a little to a change in the atmosphere of my priory cell. At home, I could always tell it was snowing by the colour of the light, the way the world became muffled and the sound grew brighter and wider. At night, even when my whole family was asleep, without even the rustle of my wool blanket on the bedsheet, there was always the sound. It's like the drone of a bow on a sultry string being played across a field, and it vibrates in a thin green line just out of the corner of my left eye. It's only disappeared a few times in my life, so it usually blends into the background. But I've learnt the hard way that no one else hears it or sees these colours except me. There are are a thousand sounds that make up silence. There's the wind blowing snow past your ears, right to left and back again. There's tree branches clacking together like drum beaters. And there's what surely must be women's cries for help, until you realise it's the boughs of a half-fallen tree squeaking against its neighbour's bark. But you can't know the loudness of silence, can you? Unless you've known what it is to be truly alone. Well, Elle Potter, welcome to Vesperisms. Hi. (laughs) Hi, I'm delighted to speak with you. And I have to tell you that when the audition tapes came in Mm -hmm. uh, for A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, I was completely blown away by your reading. It was an instant yes. (laughs) <laughs> because I felt like even in your audition, you you fully captured Edith perfectly in all her kind of idiosyncrasies. Mm. And I couldn't believe I was so lucky <laughs> that you would <laughs> wow. interpret her for me. And well, it's lovely know. to hear what it's like from 
that end because obviously I I just send a little recording from my end and then I don't even know what happens from there so some you know sometimes an author does pick your voice sometimes it's just the producer or whatever. I think because you know my books have some pretty specific things that they need and you know even in my last audiobook too we I tend to need a, a special kind of unicorn to play these characters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of accents in yeah. The Clown of Outrageous Blue. So when I first sort of started digesting the text and when I first saw the, the description of where each of the characters came from, I thought, oh, like, there's not going to be like a lot of people who can do all the accents <laughs> right. um, convincingly. And I'm not saying I did them all convincingly, but I think I tr tried my very best. Yes. And it was wonderful. So I want to, I want to talk about that part, you know, the process of the mm. actual book in a moment. But first, I'm interested in you as an artist, because mm. Vesperisms is a podcast about thinking like an artist. Mm. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. How do you find yourself doing what you do? Yeah, wow, what a good question. Um, so I've come to audiobooks uh, relatively recently, really. So I was at drama school. Um, I graduated last year. And when I was there, they had like a partnership. I, I, went, I was at Lambda, which is London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Mm -hmm. and they have a partnership with Audible. Um, and we did an open day there. And we got, you know, shown around all the facilities and did a little practice recording. And I just got on really well with everyone there and um, really enjoyed the, the feeling of narrating because I'm, I'm an absolute bookworm. So I, I, at drama school, it was a post-grad. Before that, I studied English at Oxford. So I've always been really into books. And here was this opportunity to sort of combine uh, literature with acting, which is sort of like my dream. Otherwise, I do um, a lot of comedy. Most of the theatre I do on the theatre side is comedy, uh, which I write. Uh, I do quite a lot of fringe theatre. So it's nice to have two sides of what I do and they are they're very different but they are complementary because I get the raucous kind of loads of people there vibe from fringe comedy and then the other end of the spectrum which is sitting alone with a book reading it to an imaginary audience um really intimately which I love mm. uh, and obviously during lockdown which is the inescapable sort of context of all this recording at the moment it's great to be able to carry that on because the other side of it it just isn't happening at the moment I know. um yeah so it's been lovely to do more audiobooks <laughs> recently. that's great yeah. yeah so what do you what do you miss the most about uh in-person theater uh i mean at the moment it's hard to be specific about it because it's been so long i mean i, I haven't gone this long without performing to an audience since I was really young um, and I didn't realize how much I relied on it uh, as a sort of you know form of self-expression especially the type of comedy that I do mm -hmm. um, which I mean it loosely described as comedy um, but yeah just the liveness of an audience being there the the sound before a show starts of you know people chatting and like the low hum uh and coughing obviously now that, that holds a very different sort of yeah. <laughs> resonance right. you wouldn't want to hear that before your right. show starting but yeah the butterflies the butterflies of it all the mm -hmm. fizz of it i i mean even talking about it i'm just thinking <laughs> ah bring yeah, me back that human energy i'm, I'm also a performer and oh, um, really? yeah i i really do miss that that human energy, even um, I write, I tend to write at coffee shops because I'm an extrovert and, yeah, yeah. you know, I feed off of that, that low level hum that you're saying that, you know. Yeah. Do you get your inspiration from people around you? I do. Yeah. Sometimes I'll actually, you know, eavesdrop on a conversation and it'll find its way into the book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering what conversation gave rise to the 13th century Priory conversations. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny to, you know, translate something that you hear on the subway, you know, mm. or in a cafe into 
a different time period, but you know, it's human nature. I believe human nature doesn't change. So <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. Very true. Which is what yeah. makes Edith a very relatable hmm. character, you know, all the confusion and changes she's going through. And also it makes the plague very relatable. I mean, <laughs> That yeah, was very well, pertinent. I hadn't even thought to ask you, you know, how do you, how do you feel having narrated this right in the heart of the pandemic? Well, you know, it's odd how things line up. So just before I narrated A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, I narrated another novel called Hamnet, which is inspired by Shakespeare's son, who died of the plague as well. And... Uh, I sort of couldn't believe that it seemed everything I was being involved with. I mean, somehow the plague seemed to be very trendy as like a thing (laughs) to write about, but in two different, very different with yours and and the book just before. Um, But yeah, I mean, I found I could relate to it a lot, a lot more than I thought I would be able to. You think of the 13th century, it is 13th century, isn't it? 12th, 14th, yeah. 14th sorry I get confused between like 1300s and 14th century and (laughs) maths not strong point um I neither (laughs) 14th century you'd think is sort of very distant and then something like a a literal pandemic makes it feel much closer um so the hysteria surrounding it even though we've lost some of that mystical element and the religious element of thinking we've been you know judged or punished for something that edge is sort of lost but nonetheless there's still there's still when I'm scrolling through Twitter there is something of the ardent mob uh, that's that's there Mm. um and you definitely get that in your book as well Mm. so uh yeah crazy how it's been popping up it's yeah. inescapable. <laughs> it's been quite strange. I feel like every week, you know, some headline comes up and I'm thinking, okay, this is what this too was in my book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like watching it come to life. It's a little. Yeah. And there are some thing. Agnes de Geel figures in the world that always will be right. the kind of maniac leader. Not, no, well, that's a broad brushstroke I'm painting her with, which is actually unfair and not the most nuanced to take because she's you know you get the flaws behind behind the uh, the the real flawed human behind the caricature right um which is great a shadow interrupts the light and i become aware of a lavender voice repeating good morning miss good morning you must rise now finally i focus on two figures standing above me a plump, middle-aged woman with her hands folded low, and the girl who's trying to wake me, old smiles and energy, a little older than I am. There she is, the girl chortles. Thought you might never wake. I, uh, I try to speak through a pang of embarrassment at being found sleeping on the floor when something as luxurious as a bed has been provided me. We'll be waiting outside your door then, says the older woman, with more measure. Be dressed in five minutes, and we'll tour the priory. She looks at my mass of curly dark hair. You'll veil your head, please, and bring your psalter for terse prayers. I get up and stretch the cricks in my back. I hadn't even covered myself last night, but though there's no fire... It's warmer in this room than it ever was at home. I open the chest at the foot of the bed. There's a grey habit inside, folded neatly, with a veil on top and a set of paternoster beads. I put on Mam's heavy blue dress instead, the thick wool still smelling of her, even months after her death. There's no reason to put on any nun's uniform. I'm only here to work. I grab my wrap and go out to join them, pinning the veil over my tangled braids. She let you sleep late this once, miss, since you've had a long journey, whispers the girl as we fall in step behind the older woman. But tomorrow you must be up with the prime bell. 
No one's ever called me Miss before. Me, a shepherd's daughter with dirty fingernails. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about um, specific characters in a minute because mm-hmm. I, yeah. I do want to, you know, get your take on some of those. <laughs> um, but I just I have a couple of questions about you as an actor before we get there. Yeah, sure. So, so one of the values that we talk about on Vesperisms, you know, I have sort of this like four part, you know, what makes an artistic worldview? You know, why, mm-hmm. how do artists think like artists, right? And mm-hmm. one of the values that we talk about that on that level is that art is human centered. So meaning that it's both something that we create in our human bodies, mm-hmm. whether you're a painter or an actor or a dancer, musician, but it's also something that we give to other humans in the form of our audience Mm-hmm. And acting seems to me to be an incredibly generous medium, a very giving medium. So um, you alluded to it a little bit before, you know, with the buzz of the audience and everything. But um, how do you see your relationship as an actor to your audience? Do you feel that you have, you know, a responsibility toward them? Or um, how do you feel about giving them your performance? You know, that is, that is such a good question. And I think it's something that actors wrestle with a lot. Um, at drama school, a lot of the teaching it speaks as if um, a lot of classical training looks at the audience as if they are incidental. Like the, the performance will go on whether they're there or not. And there's a kind of idea that they are witnesses to something that would happen anyway um and i think that is rubbish (laughs) to put it to put it nicely without using any rude words i think a performance doesn't exist unless someone is there to witness it um and whenever i'm i mean this is crossing over into my writing work but whenever i'm writing i can't ignore the fact that an audience will be there to receive it. And therefore all my writing is about changing my audience as much as it is about the verisimilitude of people in a situation. It is about making something happen to people who are there watching it happen. Um, And I guess the idea of an audio book as an actor performing an audio book sort of complicates that question because the audience isn't there when you're doing it. Um, But you still have to be aware that you are changing them or you're letting them into this world, especially with audiobooks rather than reading a book. You are the only way that they experience that world. Now, I learned a lot from the man who directed A Cloud of Outrageous Blue, Paul Rubin. Hmm. And I've worked with quite a lot of uh, audiobook directors now. But he had such a sensitive way of approaching the text as, as, as incredibly truthful. And because it's first person narrative, he said, you know, you want to be right inside there with her. And so in a way, my sense of the audience disappeared as I was narrating A Cloud of Outrageous Blue in a way that it wouldn't necessarily disappear with a different director with a different book because I was right inside Edith's head and I was I I, I don't know I think I think as an as a narrator it it was I learned a lot from narrating Cloud um, and from working with Paul because um, it was all about just the reality of of it which which sounds it sounds so obvious but when you're dealing with especially like a text that deals with religion and sort of mystical aspects of a narrative sometimes you can lose that uh and so i don't have a clean answer to your question because on one hand i think it's all about the audience and on another hand with a cloud of outrageous blue i learn a completely different way of um of experiencing narrating uh so I don't know. <laughs> is the well, long is the long way? Yeah, I I think no. I think that's great, and I think um, yeah, that's the tension, right? For any artist, is um, you know, I'm a commercial artist, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm an illustrator first, so I'm not. Um, 
I mean, I'm sure that fine artists who create work for galleries, you know, mm. are thinking of their audience too, you know, with the ultimate end result being in a gallery. But, mm. you know, I'm thinking of my audience as readers or as viewers of my illustrations, you know, and so there is that dance between mm-hmm. how deeply you go in your own self and in your own process and, you know, just in that work. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but always, you know, with an eye toward who is going to yeah, you know, interact with it later or consume yeah, it. Yeah, totally. Because what's the point of recording the audiobook if no one listens? And what's right. the point of putting on the play if no one's there? There, yeah. <laughs> or what's the point of doing the painting, you know, mm. uh, although, I mean, I have talked about this sometime um, at times before that as an artist, it's really important that you have the things that don't see the light of day, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the process work, you know, for a visual artist like myself, it's, um, there's so much pressure to put, make sure everything gets into the public eye, you know, on Instagram yeah. or whatever. And I think um, it's just so important that we have, as artists, those things that are just ours, you know, and that that might be the majority of what you're creating is actually just yours. Yeah, totally. And also when it's, I mean, any form of art, it's also the catharsis you get from the act of creation as well, which doesn't necessarily exist for an actor Mm. because, um, I don't know, there is this idea that acting shouldn't be therapy. So you can't really you shouldn't see it necessarily as a catharsis because you are interpreting what someone else has written. But when you, but that's another, that's another debate altogether. But when you are painting, I imagine for you, like there is some sort of release or something you learn from each brushstroke or whatever. And that's one of the things I wish that people who listen to the audiobook could see those, (laughs) could see those, um, your illustrations because they're so beautiful. Thank you. And I, I was, I'm going to ask you about that in a second, but um, what you said about catharsis. So I, I wonder now I'm not trained in theater, obviously, but since you're trained in literature, um, mm. I imagine that you've talked a lot about that with the Greek dramas and with mm. catharsis being such an important part of that. Yeah. yeah. And um, I never thought about Now, I know that in those dramas, like the catharsis is supposed to be something for the audience to experience through the work. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 But I never thought about that not being something that the actor is entitled to, I guess. It's difficult because as I was saying that, I thought, well, sometimes it's unavoidable that there will be certain roles that you really connect to. And there is there is something about releasing that within yourself that is cathartic and going out there and do it every night is cathartic. But, uh, and even, even as I'm saying that it shouldn't be, uh, let me go back on myself. So when you really connect to something or even if you've written it yourself, then it can be a cathartic experience, uh, releasing the things you've learned about that character or like really connecting to it. So it really does feel like you are, you are releasing some part of yourself into the audience or whatever and giving them a part of yourself. Mm -hmm. But there's also, I always want to be careful when I'm, when I see things that way, because there's also something slightly self-indulgent about that way of approaching something. It's very inward looking. If you go into this is it. If you go into a performance thinking, I want to experience catharsis through this performance, then that can be quite self-indulgent because you're going into it with your own mission in a way that is about you as an actor rather than the character you're serving. Um, If you go out on stage and you're so within the character that you experience catharsis through the character, then there's nothing self-indulgent about that. Um, I don't know if I've explained that very I well. And I think it's saying. something I've only realized in the moment, but I think that's yeah. the difference. It's self-indulgence versus um, genuine catharsis experience through a character. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I relate to that in the sense that, you know, as a commercial artist, there are the works that I do that are my own creation, like a cloud of outrageous mm-hmm. blue or what the night sings. And there are, 
the creations that I do for other people. So when I'm illustrating oh, right. someone's picture book, um, I'm interpreting their creation in my own way. And mm. in some way, I mean, I just illustrated a, a picture book about Jane Austen actually. And um, the whole process of that, well, I mean, you know, England is my happy place. And so, um, <laughs> so, you know, for me, it was incredibly, uh, it was an incredibly deep, you know, process, even though it was for somebody else. And the rewards that came from that were, you know, I guess you could call it a, a form of catharsis that I wasn't mm-hmm. expecting. Um, but not every project is like that. Sometimes it's just very, it can be kind of utilitarian and. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. I've experienced that before when I'm writing under commission for something. Yeah. It's just a completely different experience. Yeah. Um, it's nice to get both sides. Why, what, what, why is England your happy place? Oh, so many reasons. Um, well, first of all, I, I was born in Germany and um, I'm, I'm not German. I was born in an army base, but mm. I've, never, um, I've never really felt at home in America, you know, in the right. States. And yeah. my, but my ancestry is um, British and Scots Irish. And uh, so, you know, I still have family there. And there's just something. Um, there are some places that you feel more rooted and mm-hmm. like yourself. Mm-hmm. And I've found that, I've, I mean, I've traveled quite widely and um, I find that every time I come to England, I can just take a deep breath. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, it's, you know. Some places just do that to you. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's different for everybody. And I wouldn't call myself an Anglophile or, you know, anything mm-hmm. like that. It's just more about a, a settledness I feel there. Yeah. Can't wait to get back. I can't wait till this whole thing is over and I can just leave. Yeah. I have the same thing with, um, so my mum is Scottish uh, and my dad is part Scottish. So I'm, I'm more Scottish in my blood than I am English, but I've always lived in England. But the village where my mum is from called Braemar up in the Highlands, that's the place where my soul feels settled. That is my true home and we're going up there as a family next monday so Uh, a week basically a week uh and i cannot wait i'm gonna just be able to breathe (laughs) for the first time in a while well why don't we specifically get into cloud and your work on it so i'm interested how you prepared your audition what a great question um The audition is a funny thing because there is something slightly contrived about it always because you know you have to get you have to get in the fact that you can do the whole book justice within like three pages um so so that's like literally like a hundredth of the book so there's not very much time so i i get the text through it was it, it was uh was I yes it was an open call that I saw because sometimes producers uh will ask me to audition for things and some things are just up online so this one was just I mean just up there and I immediately when I saw the description you know it said she's from the west country and she has a Scottish friend and it's mostly set in Yorkshire and I was like well I can I can that I can do <laughs> I can do that um read the first few pages uh, and it, um, they give you like a random section, like in the middle, uh, not in the middle, towards the beginning, but not the very beginning of the book. Um, so it, because you're in the, you're sort of in the middle of the book, you have to make decisions about characters you don't know uh, that, that will have already been built up by you, the author. But in this, we just have like an island of text within a sea of unknown. Mm. So... I guess I just had to um, immediately make decisions about what kind of voice Edith had, what kind of person Alice was, um, and Agnes, what, what kind of person Agnes de Gill was. And having now read the entire book, <laughs> um, I think the presumptions I made or, or the decisions I made early on were pretty accurate. And so I'll go through um, with my coloured and highlight each character a different color and put in where I what I think needs to sort of 
ping. I remember really specifically that there's a line in the audition passage that talks about Edith's mother having passed away and her dress still smelling of oh, that, uh, her mother. I'm even getting teary thinking about your reading of that line. Because <laughs> every time I listened back to the audition tape, mm. I just, I welled up. Wow. So that's, powerful, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I just remember reading that and thinking that's a really important piece of information that they've put in this bit of in in this audition passage that probably has a huge effect on edith and it and it proves to be true um of course it would have a huge effect on edith and so there are certain sentences that just like ping out and you think i'm going to be really careful about the way i perform that um and yeah and then i um set up i do everything in my home studio at the moment Mm -hmm. because um because of uh lockdown and uh so yeah i just set up set up shop um with my mic and then just had a couple of goes but some auditions you know take a few goes before you get what you want and with this it was um actually it did take a little while i don't know how much detail you want (laughs) just a short question but uh one of the main challenges with cloud is switching between accents uh not the accents themselves and so a few times during the audition, I would like start reading a line and then suddenly be like, oh, God, no, I'm still in the old accent mm-hmm. and then have to redo it. Um, but yeah, that's that. And then send it off. And yeah. uh, that was that. Well, I thought you were, um, I, I was really specifically impressed with your accent switching because I know that was a, a particular trick <laughs> of this book. It's tricky because the accents are different enough to sound distinct, but similar enough to get confusing in in my mouth. Yeah. Um, so, for example, Edith speaks with a West Country lilt, which means that it's a rhotic accent, which means that all her R's are really overpronunciated. Mm. And then Bridget, who's Scots, also has a rhotic accent but all the vowels are much longer Mm -hmm. um but those two can really easily go into each other and then the yorkshire accent is really broad and flat and totally different but when you put it into the melting pot of all the rest it's like (laughs) it is it was a bit of a mind melt at times just towards the end of recording days where you get tired (laughs) and it's like physically your tongue is like what are you trying to make me do (laughs) yeah Yeah. and it was it was important to me just you know I had a lot of notes going into the audiobook experience that Mm. um because I you know I don't know if this is interesting to you but um well I guess as a having studied the classics you know Mm. um it was interesting to me and important that at that time, you know, one of the reasons I chose to to talk about that specific time period was because mm. there's a real dearth of um, research material before that in terms of the peasantry. Mm. And I really wanted to explore, um, you know, issues of class and issues of, uh, social mobility at the time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because um, before the plague, you know, the manorial system held, held everybody very, in very strict, you know, and I know that's, I know that didn't end, you know, I, I know that class is still obviously a very distinct thing in, in England to this day, but um, particularly at that time, pre-plague, the, the ability to move around um, through social status was very Mm -hmm. tightly controlled difficult and so it just wasn't going to do to have somebody get up there with a standish standard british accent and read the whole Mm. thing you wouldn't have gotten the subtleties of that yeah totally you needed a way for edith to sound like an outsider as well all that time yeah and a bit and a bit rougher you know Mm -hmm. maybe then then we perceive you know a, a English accent to be, you know, yeah, totally. as Americans, you know, we, we just, yeah. it's hard for people to really make those distinctions. They yeah. kind of blend together for a lot of people, but um, yeah. And that was another interesting thing leading into it um, because I've only recently started doing uh, audiobooks for an American audience. Uh-huh. And that is very different when you're thinking about 
uh, British accents because when when you say to someone from England what's an English accent sound like there are just so many regional accents they differ like you know 30 miles from yes. wherever you are you'll, you'll hear something different so, yeah I guess same same in the states um, and so there were times where I had to make sure that what I was doing would sound clear to an American ear. So some like specific words had to be toned down a bit because if I'd gone whole hog, you, it, it might have just completely disappeared. Like the meaning could have completely gone. And then there's also the fact, which Paul, the director, kept reminding me that we don't really know how they would have spoken back then. I mean, people, especially I remember uh, studying Shakespeare uh, at uni and then again at, um, at, during my postgrad at drama school uh, their Queen's English the received pronunciation which is like my natural accent wouldn't really have existed and they would have all spoken broadly with a rhotic accent like Edith would have um, but obviously you don't want everyone in an audiobook it's so important to have everyone sounding distinct because otherwise they'll just all merge together um, and historical accuracy is, you know, it, I don't think it matters as much when you're doing, um, you know, you, you, you can take, you can make presumptions that, you know, make things easier for a modern ear, which is, you know, important. Yeah. And as a writer, I mean, that's a huge consideration for me. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's, whenever you write any kind of historical fiction, but especially for some reason, the medieval. Yeah. Um, there's <clears> this, <throat> I mean, I was, I was very deliberate in the way that I wrote this in, in the vernacular, you know, yeah. in a modern vernacular, because yeah. I, it, I didn't want you to feel like you were going back in time. I wanted mm -hmm. to feel very of the moment mm -hmm. so that you could put yourself in the character because totally. if I, you know, and I, I kind of, wonder like what did you want me to do write these and thous and malords yeah 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 like, immediately on. you're holding them away like they, they feel distant yeah that was so helpful in getting into the way edith thinks as well because it, you know it's written by a, a modern writer right. and edith feels like a real living human being because of that because we understand the way she's thinking and the way she's expressing herself yeah and i think especially because it's for a young adult audience i wanted yeah you know, the teens to not miss that, you know, to, to mm. feel like Edith is somebody yeah. that you're going to school. So with. true. And also the way that I don't, I don't know what it's like in the States, but the way so often that that time period is taught in history classes or indeed in English classes, when you're first introduced to Shakespeare or, or Marlowe or whoever, some like often the these and thous really do get in the way of like realizing that they were real people. Um, and yeah, you're, you're so right that, that they need to be accessible. Yeah. And I, this is probably for another discussion at another time, <laughs> but you know, I, I, there are so many myths about the middle ages, um, and so many mm -hmm. just really unfortunate prejudices about, mm -hmm. you know, the darkness of that time and yeah, um, the dark ages, yeah. like <laughs> it's just so unfair. I mean, there were really like, you know, you read Chaucer and it's like, it's hilarious. This could be today, you know. Yeah, we had to do we had to do a lot of Chaucer uh, yeah. when I was studying English at Oxford. I mean, it's one of the things that kind is kind of annoying about the English course because it's such an old university. You you do all the super old stuff, and it, it's really quite weighted into old white authors, which is like rubbish to be honest in a lot of ways. But it does mean that you're looking at Chaucer and like reading jokes he made about farts. And yeah. you're like, nothing's changed. <laughs> no, nothing has changed. Um, so uh, you alluded to this before, um, but so I know a lot of readers of my previous book, What the Night Sings, mm -hmm. actually listened to the audiobook along with the physical ah. um, illustrated copy. And I had heard that that really helped. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I've no just problem. knocked over some rubbish here. Yeah, okay, I'm here. <laughs> I have a cup of tea here and I'm like paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, spill it over your laptop. Um, but, but um, you know, so having these multiple formats became important for reluctant mm -hmm. readers and um, kids with learning disabilities and things like that. And so I was wondering... Uh, yeah, if you had seen the illustrated copy or were you reading along with an illustrated copy and how 
you know, if at all, did the illustrations affect your interpretation and your performance? Yeah. So I had the illustrated copy and that's what I was narrating from. Never saw any other type. And I am so pleased that I had the illustrations because, you know, it, 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 it's lovely. Um, it's lovely when it's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to um, say that not having illustrations means that it's a more difficult job if you're a narrator or, you know, you can't connect it to it in the same way, but it just means that I was so on your page about how you wanted it to feel like it's not even just about what a character looks like because so many of your your illustrations give more than just like the facts of the situation and what things look like they're painting an atmosphere or an emotional aura of a situation or a person which is so helpful because you can't you can't necessarily get that through other mediums and it just meant that I in the same way that like Edith can see color uh, or hear certain sounds it just meant that I was so aware of what what those sounds were meant to look like if that makes sense I'm mixing my metaphors but because so much of the book is to do with color uh, it was just wonderful to have a reference point of of what your mind was thinking of when you were writing that. Um, so that was lovely. When I was actually, I mean, it was, it was very helpful in my prep, thinking about the characters and stuff. But when I was actually narrating it, it was pretty text focused because I was aware of the fact that readers wouldn't have the luxury necessarily of reading along with the illustrations. And so I had to sort of let it inform the way I narrated it ultimately without um, letting it completely guide uh, or dictate how certain things would go. Um, So yeah, it was just lovely to be properly inside your image of the book. The day progressed with its games and drinks, the first true feast of the year. Mothers and fathers pretended not to notice their sons and daughters going off in pairs, There might, after all, be favourable matches made on May Day. Today, every answer was yes. I took a pork pie from the table and filled my cup with Mam's Groot Ale. Behind me, I could feel someone standing a bit too close inside the boundary of my own space. I turned my head slowly, hoping it was him. Sure, it couldn't be. It was. Mary Appbrook's pork pies are good, said Mason, but try the egg and onion kind instead. Here, I'll take one and we can share. He was next to me. His shaggy, ash blonde hair was tucked behind his ear. I started to sweat and get dizzy. He was talking. To me, the thought of eating in front of him was mortifying, so visible. In my mind, I nodded, but really, I just stared. Mason smiled at me, and I could see how vivid his eyes were. The only time people looked at me was when they were making fun of me. But he wasn't. Suddenly, he turned and started walking away toward the churchyard. He looked back at me and jerked his head. Aren't you coming? So I followed behind him like a clumsy little newborn lamb. Mason wove through the graves under the gigantic yew tree and hopped up onto the stone wall without even putting down his cup and pie. I put my things on the ledge and hoisted myself up, praying that my round head wouldn't topple me over onto the other side. Did you like the dance? asked Mason. It was fun. Suddenly, I hated the way my mouth formed words. I stuffed in a piece of pork pie. It was intolerably dry. I swigged some groot and almost choked. My favourite part is seeing everyone out in their skivvies. Mason laughed, tugging on his woollen braise. I smiled and looked at my chemise. Good thing the dancing sped up. I was freezing. Me too, 
It felt like the sun would never come up. Longest winter ever, I mused. I didn't mind it so much, said Mason. With Henry and me trading work for our fathers, I got to see you every Sunday. I whipped a look of shock at Mason. What? He shrugged. I looked forward to it. But we've never talked or anything. We're talking now, aren't we? He tugged at my sleeve. Y you're not playing a trick on me, right? I leaned back and looked over the wall to be sure no one was lying in wait. I sat up quickly and brushed his arm. He seemed closer than before. A trick? He looked confused. Between us was the spring air, the fading perfume of my flower crown and the group, and I let myself look at him, like we did at the dance, like I was supposed to be there, like I was meant to memorise the deep blue of his eyes. Mason broke his egg and onion pie in half and handed me the larger piece, and I did the same with mine. We talked and joked, way into the night by the bonfire, and every scrap of my awkwardness blew away in the fresh air. I wasn't sure what was happening, only that things were different, and that all things were possible. Um, so, so let's get specific about some characters. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are your impressions of the main character, Edith Le Sherman, and what did you feel it was important to bring to her character, either by um, what you read on the page or how you interpreted her through your own lens? Mm. For me, just her central arc throughout the narrative is from someone who's really unsure of herself and lost to like the pinnacle of knowing who she is, why she's here, and having the confidence in herself to fulfill uh, expe expectations of her. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to bring out that arc without hammering it too obviously. So she has to start off, she starts off nervous and unsure of herself, but she also has like grit all the way through. She has this sort of this spine to her and which you know there are certain passages of the novel where you could get uh as a narrator I could have become overly emotional about her but that's not who she is at all she's she, whatever her situation whatever the the melancholy of her situation is and the tragedy of you know what she's faced in her life she always has like this hardiness to her from being an outsider. Um, so that was important for me to bring out. But to be honest, approaching an audiobook is like, is less about what I want to bring out as a narrator and more about just letting the words sing because you've done all the hard work as a writer of like making sure that comes out. And it means that, with a book like this, I get to sort of sit back and enjoy the fact that it will happen. I don't have to like shoehorn my own interpretation of a character in there uh, because you've already made it the shape it has to be. Um, so I didn't have to overdo anything. I didn't have to like, there, there have been other books I've done where I've, I, have, I, I have had to do more with like shaping a character um and i just didn't have to she was already so whole if that makes sense wow thank you <laughs> and i think one of the things that i loved about your narration was that it was so relaxed you know that mm -hmm. i i didn't feel like you were trying to force anything you know force edith to to mm -hmm. like to push her out or something yeah yeah and that was something that with Paul, the director, we, we really worked on is that because it's first person, you are sitting there right with her. And so I don't have to over explain anything. I just have to say it. And, you know, I don't have to 
lusciously paint. I don't have to use my voice to make the images luscious because they already are. Like when we're talking about the, the colour that Edith sees, I don't have to really over sensationalize it or like, um, I don't know, there's, you can sort of make certain words sparkle when you're a narrator and then that can sound like a little bit pushed sometimes. I don't, I don't have to push it at all when the work is done. I mean, sometimes it feels like the easiest job in the world. It's just a, you know, it's just a happy time <laughs> reading, reading aloud for the joy of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I read, I read aloud to my kids almost every night and they're teenagers. So we've been doing this since oh, they were Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. They I, haven't got to the point where they're like, mom, stop. <laughs> no, no. For some reason. Yeah. That's I mean, good. it depends on the book I'm reading, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. It must help to have a mom who's a writer and a performer in her own right, because, you know, you're probably quite a good reader aloud, you know. <laughs> well, I hope so. They seem to, they seem to like it, but um yeah. Sometimes the shoemaker's children have no shoes. So <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So yeah, I, I wish I could, you know, do more for my kids what I, you know, do in my job, but mm-hmm. yeah. So um okay, so what was your favorite character and what character did you love to hate, let's say, or what char- yeah. which character was the biggest challenge for you? Okay, my favorite character has to be Bridget, I've got to say because she's just so down to earth and like tells it how it is and isn't afraid of being like slightly rude um it, she's just brutally honest mm-hmm. and that's lovely because obviously you're painting a picture of a priory that has like a proper way of doing things and has like a regimented structure and then there's Bridget like slopping paint around and like being a bit raucous <laughs> um and I also love doing Scott's accent um so it was a pleasure to perform um because it yeah because my family is Scottish so you know it's just uh, just lovely to inhabit her yeah um what was the second one again um which character did you I'm saying love to hate love to hate I mean the I mean the I mean I have to say Agnes de Gaulle um spoke briefly about her earlier but the fact that you get I love to hate her because well, I, maybe that's a bit cruel for Agnes because I feel like by the end you really you really get her you know you you get the root of her tragedy and you understand her as a three dimensional <laughs> yeah 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 no, no spoilers yeah. but you you understand her and even all the way through you know she she walks that line between like kind of austere um guardian figure in a way Mm. uh looking after edith but also you know telling her off when she needs to Mm -hmm. and she can take it a bit far as we discover Mm -hmm. um so i love to hate her in the sense that she's you know she had a lot of again she had a lot of depth to her um, when you get to that epiphany, uh, the the revelation of like why she is the way she is, essentially, um, I f- I just feel like she was fully rounded. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, it's nice to sometimes dip your toe into the villain, you know, yeah. Yeah. the character of the villain, without going full pantomime yeah. with it. Um, yeah, and uh, that was something really important to me because. Um, I think a lot of books that I've read, contemporary books, um, and I think it has to do a lot with our kind of current mindset and the way that mm-hmm. we're um, drawing a lot of very firm lines in the sand yeah. on a lot of things, that it's just so easy to castigate people in like mm-hmm. black or white. Mm-hmm. And, um, but humans are so much more complex and interesting than that. And um, I kind of have this philosophy that I try to take through my life that you, you never know what somebody else is going through. And so, um, it, you know, when I was pregnant with one of my kids, I remember standing on the queue at um, the grocery store and some lady, you know, cutting me off like, yeah. very obviously. And I, you know, I'm hugely pregnant and you just shouldn't do that. You know, and she yeah. said, excuse me, I was here, you know, and she told me off. And oh. even that, even as like, just wicked as that is for somebody to do, I thought, 
there's a story there. Like you don't mm. take that out on a perfect stranger yeah. unless there's something else going on. Yeah. And so, um, and I, I've been sort of dismayed to see some fiction really um, just becoming too neat when it mm-hmm. comes to, or or where you can kind of see the agenda of the author where they want to make yeah. some statement and it's just too on the nose. And so I remember talking with my daughter, um, who's an avid reader, and we were talking about villains. And we said, yeah, we don't like those kinds of characters. They're too, they're too neat. Mm. You, know, you need to, you need to understand where even an evil person, you need to understand what's behind that because that comes from somewhere. Yeah. And especially I feel like that's quite a big responsibility as a writer of young adult fiction too, is that so often we, we are presented with a, the broad brushed stroke of someone's moral compass. So you have Cinderella who is good and you have the ugly stepsisters who are bad and the stepmom who is bad. And there's no nuance, like all the way through the way that we learn literature, there's you're, you're taught everything in binaries yeah. in a way. And that's unhelpful and almost like in like every approach to every aspect of life, be it like gender or sexuality or you know literature um it's not helpful to go with the reductive view so i think uh i think having that in a young adult book is really important because you're not you're not teaching like good and evil you're teaching why we might perceive someone as evil and why they might have become the way they are um empathy you're teaching empathy yeah. Yeah. And I, I think for a young adult audience, like you're saying, like, I'm very aware, um, you were saying something earlier about, uh, about acting, not being therapy. Mm. And I feel very passionately that there, I think there are genres that you can go ahead and indulge in, in your therapy as you mm-hmm. know, as you write the book, but when you're writing for other people's children, yeah, I don't feel that that's something that I'm entitled to do. I feel Um, a real sense of responsibility toward my readers. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm not trying to be didactic and, um, you know, be moralistic and teach them a lesson about the world. It's more just like here, this is the way the fabric of the world kind of exists. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really important for you to know as you get out there, just to keep an open mind, not draw your lines so firm before Mm -hmm. you had a chance to just know a lot of different kinds of people and situations. Yeah, that's really interesting because we were talking earlier about your awareness of audience, my, my, aware, my awareness of audience as an actor. So when you're approaching a young adult book, are you thinking in a different way to how you would approach, you know, an adult's book? Me personally, yeah. um, that consideration is there, but it's not necessarily a governing principle mm-hmm. because I, I never set out to write. Well, I'm, I never set out to write per, you know, <laughs> right. first place. I, you know, I'm an illustrator, yeah. Um, yeah. but my, my governing kind of value when I do any kind of work is to tell the truth. Yeah. So, um, I, yes, like, when I'm writing for, you know, a a character who's 17 or something like that, I have to put myself back in like how I thought as as 17, Mm -hmm. how I perceived the world and everything. But I'm, I'm not going to talk down to my readers. I'm not Mm going to say, you know, I, as the adult, I'm like steering you through, you know, like, Mm. um, yeah, like you have to, you have to see it like a proper grown up. you know, it's, yeah. I, I, yeah, I totally. And it doesn't read like, I always wonder where people draw the line in like, what is young adult fiction and what is like adult <laughs> fiction? Where is that? Because, you know, I, I'm an adult and I read your book and I loved it. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> so I feel like adults will also learn things from that. And we can learn those from children's books as well. And uh, yeah, and fairy tales. And yeah. So what do you hope that listeners take away from a cloud of outrageous blue um okay the first thing that jumped into my head just then was like super corny but I'll say it anyway which is to like accept magic (laughs) I know that sounds like 
super spiritual and wishy-washy but there is you know synesthesia is a real thing and that is magic as far as i'm concerned like that's absolutely incredible and you can look at whatever analogies you want into like magic and stuff and you know loads of my friends are into astrology and things like that but basically it's like forms of faith right and edith has a faith in like a higher power but really it's like a faith in herself um so yeah i guess um faith in yourself and in the universe um that's very that's very um wishy-washy but that i cannot deny that that is that is what i hope people take away and yeah grit and determination in self um i won't give anything away about the book but um yeah i think edith's journey is is like you know at times tragic and um i mean i won't give away spoilers Mm -hmm. uh but also hopeful in its own way uh and we can probably take a bit of that right now also what has made me want to do is paint loads more like your description of the paints and stuff um so yeah get a bit artsy Mm, (laughs) what do you want people to take away from your novel yeah i think just an openness to um possibility and difference and um, my my passion is always for artists to accept that um, there's a place for them in this world, even if it doesn't, even if they don't mm-hmm. fit. And they, you know, there is definitely a lot of me in Edith in yeah. reconciling with being someone who has never fit, um, mm-hmm. and who who all, I always find myself in the in between, you know, on the margins. You could say mm-hmm. just. Um, too too much of this for one camp too much of this for the other you yeah, know yeah. Or, or like yeah and i i just think it's so important for artists or you know any kid who feels that they're different to recognize that that's how they were made mm-hmm. um and and that that they were made that way on purpose yeah you know because at i think it especially at a time where these really bitter lines are being drawn in a time where things are so polarized and we're mm. being, you know, by, by very external forces, we're being pitted against each other. Mm. Um, the artists are the ones who have the capacity to bring unity to those things and mm-hmm. to bring um, wholeness um, and to help people feel like they have a place, you know? Mm. So that's, that would be really important to me. Yeah, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, El, I want to thank you so much for coming on Vesperisms, and I just I cannot wait for readers to <laughs> readers and listeners to hear your performance of thank you. Blue. And it's just been an honor to speak with you. It's been lovely to to be on. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me for this week's Vesperisms. Well, how about you? Have you ordered your copy of A Cloud of Outrageous Blue yet? Listen, I've got a lot of fun book events coming up, mostly online, and these are not going to be your average author talking head Zoom calls, people. I've got giveaways and games and challenges and calls for fan art and even a cook-along coming up, and each event will have something just a little bit different. So you're going to want to follow me on Instagram at Vesper Illustration and subscribe to my monthly newsletter at VesperIllustration.com. And when you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll not only get my latest news and events, but you'll get a free outtake chapter from A Cloud of Outrageous Blue. And I would love if you would leave me a kind review here and on my book pages on Amazon and Goodreads. That'll help others find this podcast and my books because we need to spread the message of an artistic worldview to more people, don't you think? Music for Vesperisms is, as always, provided by Ben and Vesper. And that's my band. My fellow artist, you were born into this generation on purpose for a purpose. Your voice is important and your contribution matters. And just remember, work isn't everything, but everything is the work. See you next time.